Hero. Hello, my Dev Nation friends from everywhere in the world. I'm so glad that you're here because this week has been crazy. I know everybody's anxious about what is happening in the world, but don't worry. We have an even more interesting subject because, you know, lots of Java developers worldwide, they have their faces with bugs into production. You want to have, you have some performance bottlenecks and you want to know what's going on. And when we're running containers, it's even harder. But today we have a very special guest. Andrew Azores is going to talk everything about these particular problems and how to solve them. So, Andrew, thank you very much, and the stage is yours. Great. Thank you, Edson. Um, so I'm going to do everyone's favorite thing and start with some slides, um, but I'll try to get through them quickly enough um, that we can jump into the demo shortly after. Um, so this is a dense topic when it comes to profiling and doing things like that. Uh, so. Some of these things are maybe going to be uh, glossed over a little quickly, so I definitely encourage people uh, you know, look it up uh, or reach out to us if you have any more questions or ask in the stream. Uh, there will be some time at the end for questions. Um, so we're going to talk profiling. We're going to talk JFR and mission control. We're going to talk about JFR specifically in containers. Then we'll talk about our new project, Container JFR, with a demo. And then if there's time at the end, which hopefully there will be, we're going to talk about uh, how to set up your container application uh, for use with Container JFR. Um, so profiling with JVMs. Um, if you're Java developers watching this, you probably already know. But if you're running in a JVM, it's a virtual machine. Um, it has some intrinsic metrics that it can tell you about, uh, as opposed to a statically compiled binary, uh, like a C application or whatever. Uh, so the JVM itself knows what it's doing and what your application is doing within it at runtime. And there's a few interfaces and ways you can get data out of the JVM, um, such as JMX and the MX beans, or you can use a runtime agent, uh, or for the past couple of years, there's also a flight recorder, and that's what we're going to focus on. Uh, and we'll go over why uh, we choose that shortly. Um, but so some examples of useful metrics that you might care about. Um, that can be captured are things like your I.O., your thread states, uh, when garbage collection happens and how long it's taking, and your CPU and your memory and your heap allocation, uh, all things like that. And so this can give you a pretty complete picture of uh, where all of your resources are going and what might be happening with your application uh, at runtime. So Play Recorder itself uh, is built into your JVMs, um, and it's... Uh, it's not an additional thing you have to install. If you're using a modern OpenJDK, uh, you already have access to this. So if you don't have familiarity already, you should go look it up after this talk uh, and see all the details of what this thing is and what it can do for you, because it's a lot to talk about. Um, but to just to give a short summary, so why might you use Flight Recorder over MX Beans? Um, Flight Recorder will inherently uh, have the ability to persist to disk, and it collects into a circular buffer so it doesn't just consume all of your memory if you leave it running. Um, you can start it with the JVM at startup time with a JVM flag, and it can automatically dump to disk when the JVM exits. Um, and uh, the JVM itself will be doing this, so you don't need to have some kind of a JMX client connected to your JVM um, to pull those metrics out. It'll just do it on its own, and you can check in later. So that's great. Um, what about versus a monitoring agent? Um, an agent could probably do a lot of these things for you too, including the fact that the agent runs as uh, sort of attached to your application JVM. Um, but Flare Recorder is built in, so you don't even need to write any additional code or anything. It's just configuration. Uh, and a lot of things that you would maybe replicate uh, as far as a circular buffer and persisting to disk, those are already implemented for you. And uh, it's a core component of the JVM, so you really don't need to worry about the quality of that code. Uh, or how it might impact your application at runtime. Uh, and so uh, JFR is present uh, in OpenJDK since version 11 and all forward, as well as some of the more recent update builds of OpenJDK 8. Uh, and also a very powerful and compelling feature is that it has an API for JFR events uh, that you can actually um, define your own events that are tailored to your application. So in addition to the things I talked about before, with things like thread states and network I.O., you can define an event for a web server request or a database access. And then when your JVM uh, goes through its, its uh, regular you know, runtime application flow, it'll trigger and record events for your uh, network I.O. and uh, 
your, your uh, thread states, but it'll also record your application uh, doing things like web server and database accesses into one uh, merged representation of that data. So it's very easy after the fact to correlate these things together and see exactly what's going on in your application. The best part is that all this happens with extremely low overhead, being that it's built into the JVM itself, and a lot of it's written in uh, you know, the C++ of the native code. So there's really very, very little overhead to doing any of this. Um, and you can also start and stop JFR over a JMX connection, which is part of the key here of what we're going to do with container JFR. So Mission Control is a desktop application that was open sourced alongside with JFR. And the point of Mission Control is that's where you go when you have a JFR file and you want to analyze the data within it. So this deserves its own whole tech talk. I can't really get into it today, um, but you should also look at Mission Control if you're not familiar. Um, it has all kinds of different views and ways to organize your information and really deep dive into what exactly is contained by your flight reporter recordings. Uh, and so the main thing we want to do is get your recordings out of your container JVMs and get them to you so that you can then run mission control and open up those flight recording files um, specifically from your containerized applications. And so there's a challenge there. Um, JMC is a desktop application, so it doesn't really run in the cloud. How do you connect it to your JVM? Well, you can use JMX is a network thing, but JMX isn't HTTP. And so if you're in OpenShift or Kubernetes, how do you expose that? Do you even want to expose that directly outside of the cluster? Probably not. So how do we make these things work together? And um, there are maybe some other things you could try. So with uh, JFR itself, well, you can make it dump to a file, but if we're in a container, that file system isn't really accessible to us. Uh, you can start up at, uh, at startup time without using JMX, but then what if you notice a bug in production? You don't want to tear down the instance of your application to start profiling it. That doesn't really work if it has to be configured at startup time. Um, you can use JMX to start and stop at runtime, but now we're back to the problem of how do you connect to that JMX connection from outside of the cluster? So this is where our container JFR steps in. Um, and it's a pretty simple idea. It's a JVM application itself, and it runs as a pod in uh, your namespace, sort of as a sibling or a sidecar alongside your application. And then it lets you use JMX from within the namespace, so uh, over a service between your pods, you use JMX to, to uh, communicate with the application from container JFR. And then it has an API, which is exposed over HTTP or HTTPS, and that's routable, so you can easily export that as a service and a route from your OpenShift or Kubernetes. Um, and we also provide some uh, analysis tools in the container JFR itself. So you don't always have to pull your JFR uh, recordings out of the cluster uh, first before finding out what's in them. So all that done, that took me like seven minutes. Um, let's get to the exciting stuff, it's demo time. So um, what I have is, um, uh, I've deployed container JFR uh, with an operator that we also have. So if I just check what's um, deployed in my namespace, I have um, the operator itself and container JFR and two um, demo applications. And so if I go ahead and I uh, open up um, the container JFR dashboard, which I've already done in my browser here, um, we get this login page. And this is asking me for a token, so that's going to be my um, OpenShift account token. And so uh, you just do um, OC who am I dash T to get that. PP copy is going to copy it to my clipboard. So I'll paste that in. And then I'm logged into my container JFR with my OpenShift credentials. Um, and so I'm going to go to the events view first, and I'm going to select this uh, one of the two demo applications. So we have a couple of things here. Uh, one is the event types, which we'll talk about first. Um, so this JVM has 135 different kinds of events that it can record and tell us about. These are all the ones that are built into the JVM version that this application was built on. Um, there could be more or less depending on your JVM. This could also include custom ones that you've tailored to this application if you've compiled the application with those um, written in. So there's a lot of information you can find out here. 
Um, you can check for things like garbage collection events and see the options on those events and the default values. So by default, this would be uh, false if you don't enable it. Um, there's also things like thresholds. So if the event takes a less than threshold, it won't be recorded. Uh, and there's a lot of information you can find here for things like memory or errors or um, lots and lots. Um, this is probably worth, again, looking up the documentation for this because this is a massive topic. Uh, but the idea is these events can tell us something useful about our application if we combine them in sort of the right ways. And so those combinations, um, there are two that come with uh, this JVM and probably most recent OpenJDKs. The first two here are named continuous and profiling, and those names are pretty self-explanatory. So continuous is meant so that you can just turn it on and leave it on all the time in production, and this will help you to catch any problems that might be occurring at production time. And profiling is meant for you to enable um, specifically when you've noticed some kind of a problem and you're trying to figure out uh, where that problem lies exactly, why it's happening, that kind of thing. Um, these events are really just XML documents that you can download. And so I've already downloaded one here, the profiling one, and I've opened this up in an editor. Um, it's uh, a bit of a large XML document. Mission Control itself can also help you edit these with a nice graphical wizard. Uh, to enable different um, events and settings and all that without having to write it directly in XML manually. Um, but it's really just an XML document. And then once you've um, edited or created your own profile, you can then re-upload uh, your own template to ContainerJFR to use later. For now, we're just going to go ahead and use one of the two existing ones. So I'm going to select the profiling one and create a recording. So I'm going to go ahead and just name the recording demo. I'm going to let it run for one minute. If I say continuous, it'll just run until uh, you stop it manually. It'll just continue running forever. With this setting of one minute, after one minute, it'll automatically stop. And then I'll go ahead and create that. Uh, so now what we see here is this list of active recordings. So these are the ones that live in this JVM. So if I change context to a different application, I'll see that there are no active recordings, and if I change back, I still see that one. Um, so these are the ones that live in that circular buffer that I was talking about earlier that JFR implements. And so at this point, we haven't actually transferred the data anywhere. We just know some metadata about it, which we've retrieved over JMX. Um, since this lives in a circular buffer, maybe you're thinking at this point, well, what if my application goes away somehow? What if it crashes? What if I scale it down and back up? Uh, and we have a solution for that. It's pretty easy. You just have to archive that recording, and what that does is it takes a snapshot of it at this point in time, uh, and, oh, I've done it before, <laughs> it copies it into a persistent volume managed by container JFR. And so that allows us to make sure that even if your application is scaled down or otherwise it goes away, your recording data isn't uh, lost. It's persisted to disk um, that container JFR manages. Uh, now, whether it's an archived or an active recording, there are some actions you can do to them. Um, so the first one we're going to look at is seeing the uh, inline automated reports. And so this application isn't really doing much right now because we haven't even opened the application, so it's just sitting there idling. Um, but we can see some things in this automatic analysis. And I can also open this uh, report up uh, in a sort of a full screen by downloading the document. And so if you've used JMC before, this will look familiar. Uh, this is generated by Mission Control. Uh, we have sort of a headless version of it running in JF, uh, container JFR. Um, the sort of short and sweet of it is this uses some rules that are uh, determined in JMC to, uh, to look at various metrics and determine is there any problem uh, or probable problem. So for this demo application, for example, we have a nice bright red 100 score, meaning something's very wrong here. And it's for management agent settings. And the reason why is this demo application doesn't have SSL or authentication enabled. And so that's a big red warning flag, which is good that it warns us of that. Um, we have another lower red score here. If it was a bit lower, this might be yellow or orange. And it's telling us that other processes are using a lot of CPU. So maybe that's going to slow us down. Um, there's a lot of stuff in here. And if you had a real application you were profiling in your demo, you might see um, some more uh, numbers and interesting metrics um, going on here. Uh, but the point of this automated report is really just to show you uh, at a glance, is, is something going wrong with your application? 
Um, if you see everything green, you're probably okay. If you see things that are red or even yellow or orange, um, then this tells you maybe it's worth taking a closer look. So speaking of taking a closer look, uh, we can also view this um, the information in this report in Grafana. So this is another container that's within the uh, container JFR pod. I've previously logged into it here, so my credentials are pre-filled. Uh, normally you would need to log into this as well since we're accessing it from outside the cluster. And uh, is also uh, pre-configured with this Grafana dashboard. So it was a short recording of only one minute um, on a sample application that wasn't doing a whole lot at the time, but we can still zoom in and see what information was captured. Uh, and so we can see things like the CPU load, the network utilization, um, heap apparently no allocations were made at the time. Uh, but we can see all these things within this dashboard. And being that this is simply a Grafana dashboard, you can also customize this dashboard um, however you'd like. So you can add or remove these things if you had an application tailored metric. So for example, your web server requests or your database uh, accesses, um, if they look like time series data, you can configure them to show up in this kind of a dashboard as well. And so then you can see a correlation between maybe you would see a CPU spike every time there's a database access and think, oh, that doesn't really seem right. Let's go take a look at the code and see why that might be. Um, and then the last thing that we might want to do with our recordings is um, download them. So, so far, everything I've showed you with this automated report and with the Grafana dashboard uh, all this has happened within the cluster. I'm not sure if you caught on to that. Um, so we haven't needed to transfer any of the information out of our namespace even. Everything's happened in the cloud, in our uh, in my code ready containers, OpenShift uh, instance, just all there, um, which is great. It, it means a lot of things. It's, uh, it means that we can see this data um, in a shared way. So we can have more than one developer or ad, uh, admin who wants to look at these metrics um, they can all see the exact same data without having to download it and then like email the JFR file to each other or anything like that. Um, it also means that we can do this from any device. So I happen to be on a desktop computer, but um, in theory, if I could screen share, I could have done the demo to this point basically on a tablet uh, or a phone. So no matter where you are, um, you can see these metrics for your runtime uh, performance and profiling totally from anywhere as long as you have a connection to your cluster. Um, but like I said, there's also JDK mission control and that provides a lot more power for analysis. Um, too much for me to really go into in this demo because mission control is big. Uh, there's a lot of things that it does and can do for you. Um, but the idea is you can also download these JFR files to your local disk, uh, to your computer, your, your workstation, and then now we have that on our local disk and we can open that up with mission control um, and do the full-fledged analysis. And so that's kind of the workflow here is you would check and see, maybe you notice while you're using an application that something feels slow or you're noticing an error rate. So you go through, you check the automated analysis, you see some metric looks like maybe there's a problem. You then jump into Grafana to see for sure, okay, what does a time series of that look like? Does this really look like a problem? Can I see any correlations that might tell me what the problem really is? Um, and if that's still not enough, then you would download the recording to your local disk, open it with JMC, and do the full deep dive with all the power of JMC to tell you uh, what exactly is going on in your application. Uh, and so that's pretty much what this demo has uh, at this time. Um, I'm gonna go back to my slide deck and we're gonna talk a little bit about how do you actually set up your applications uh, to work with container JFR and uh, how we keep your data safe. So obviously if you're doing anything like uh, profiling related with your applications, you wanna make sure that that profiling data is secure and safe and it doesn't get into the wrong hands um, because there could be sensitive things contained in things like environment variables even even if you're not doing things like taking heap dumps or stack traces or anything like that, um, metadata is important too. So we try very hard to make sure that we do things in a way that container JFR isn't going to leak your application data uh, anywhere. Um, so the first sort of um, tenet here is that it's sort of non-interference is the way I, I think about it. 
And so what I mean there is that we don't have to attach a runtime agent to your application. We don't need to compile in a library, any kind of support library, uh, anything like that. The only thing you have to do is use standard JVM flags to enable JMX. And then from that point, Container JFR talks to the JVM itself with its own built-in systems, and everything happens through that. So there's no need to recompile and rebuild. There's no attachment of an agent or any additional code, uh, third-party code like that. It's just your application. The second main tenet is that, that it's all encrypted, or at least it supports encryption if your application is doing it. Um, so the JMX connection itself can be encrypted, and so if you provide that certificate to Container JFR and, and that way it's JVM trusts your application, you can use uh, in, an encrypted connection over JMX to make sure that even within your cluster, uh, you're not going to be um, susceptible to man-in-the-middle attacks or anything like that. And then the HTTP API as well that uh, Container JFR exposes also uses HTTPS by default so that between yourself and the cluster, again, um, that data transfer when you're doing things like downloading recordings is also um, secured and encrypted. And the last thing is the authentication. And so we saw this the first thing when I opened the dashboard was I had to log in to Container JFR with my uh, OpenShift account credentials. And then the second layer, which I said that I disabled for this demo, is uh, authentication on the JVM itself. And so the JMX connection, when you configure it, uh, you can enable a username and password authentication. And so when you try to connect to an off, uh, application like that, you'll get an off prompt within Container JFR's dashboard asking you for your credentials um, to authenticate you against the specific application that you're trying to connect to. And so this way we can really make sure that um, the only people who have access to your data are the people who should, and no one can read your uh, data while it's sort of in flight. And so how do you actually set that all up? Uh, well, it's really not that hard. It's just some JVM flags. Um, some of these are technically optional, like the SSL and the authentication, but if you're doing this in production for an application you care about, you should definitely be enabling these things. Um, so these are basically all the flags you might need are on the screen right now. Um, the only other thing to sort of take note of is the port number. So by default, Container JFR looks for a port numbered 9091. Um, if you're using this in Kubernetes or OpenShift, it'll also look for ports that have the specific name JFR JMX. And so when either of those conditions is true, um, then it'll detect that port as something that it thinks is compatible um, to connect to. Otherwise, it'll ignore it and you won't see it in the list of things in the dropdown. And uh, that's basically it. Um, I do have a couple of minutes, so I'm going to do something really quick for an additional demo in the console. Um, and so something that's really cool is because it's using an operator, um, like I said, we also have some CRDs, custom resources. Um, so these flight recorders correspond to what we saw on the dropdown list of targets to connect to. And so uh, we also have another custom resource that corresponds to the recording objects. And so I have one that I made there, but if I uh, delete that one, I can recreate it. Um, so we have a CR, an example here. Oh, sorry for the dark theme. Um, I can name it demo, I'll name it demo three. Um, this is the equivalent of what we saw in the UI where we use the profiling template. Uh, we can make this duration a little longer. Archive true means that when this automatically uh, is stopped after one minute, it'll be saved to the archives that we talked about before. And um, this, yeah, it's the same. This is telling us, uh, or telling the, uh, the operator uh, which flight recorder instance that we want to create this recording in. Um, so I can go ahead and um, write that, and then if I do OC create on that custom resource, um, the recording is created, and I can see that it exists, and I can dump it out as YAML, for example, um, and there's a lot more metadata now that's included now that the resource has been created. Uh, a lot of things. Uh, interestingly, we have a download URL. And so what we can do with that is we can do something like uh, we can curl. Um, I'll need to add an authorization header. Oops. Really quickly, bear oc umi dash t. And then the URL. And... Uh, yeah, it's not going to write that to my terminal because it's binary, but I can do output demo3.jfr 
and there it is, just in the console without using a graphical client. Um, we can download our JFR out of the uh, out of the cluster um, just with a tool like Perl or, or wget or what have you. Um, and so there's more to talk about here with the uh, the OC API as well with the custom resources and and resource definitions. Um, but this is maybe sort of the interesting thing to see how you would use this to pull your information um, out of your applications without having to go through a web UI. And so this can be used for scripting and whatever else you'd like to do that way. Um, and that's pretty much the end of my demo. I'm right about on time here. I think I have 24 minutes. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop sharing. And Edson, if we have any questions or anything, um, let me know. Yes, we do. Well, I'm pretty sure everybody is amazed about what we can do with Container JFR. Um, I'm impressed. And we yep. <laughs> have a question here from Bruce. Uh, he was wondering because you showed the demos running on top of OpenShift. So the question is, uh, does it work on OKG2 or any other Kubernetes distribution, for example? Yeah, so the operator specifically right now, uh, it does have dependency on OpenShift stuff, but we're working actively to you know reduce that coupling so we can run on other Kubernetes. Um, the container JFR um, container itself can run anywhere. So I have a demo application where it runs just in Podman. It definitely runs in Kubernetes too. Um, it has, um, at runtime, it does some checks to try to figure out what platform it's running in. And so it can detect Kubernetes and it has a tailored way to discover applications running in Kubernetes uh, as opposed to OpenShift. Um, so specifically for the operator right now, the answer is soon. Um, for container JFR sort of upstream itself, the answer is yes. Uh, you just need to deploy it manually rather than using an operator. Awesome. And another question here. Uh, this one I have to read because that's a big one. Let me see. So Ewings is asking, is the data aggregation from multiple VMs, presumably using Rage, same app in the same pods? Or is it more like an APM space at this point? Yeah, I don't know if I understood it correctly. Yeah, um, so all we have right now, I, currently, that we, we can expose is uh, the JFR files themselves. Um, so. The JFR files are sort of a, a per JVM um, stream of data, if you want to look at it that way. Um, so, if, so if you're asking, I think the question is like, if you have an application that's made of more than one JVM, um, how would you aggregate the JFR data across them? That's a great question. That's something that we're working on. Um, you know, we, we definitely want to be able to merge those data streams so that you can see your whole application, which might have multiple microservices, for example, uh, all at once. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, we're working on it. It's uh, that's a little bit more work than we've done so far. Um, that's a big, a big uh, thing to implement. Um, and it, yeah, it goes beyond a little bit the scope we have so far. Um, but that's on a roadmap for the future. Awesome. Well, I think we don't have any more questions on the chat, but as I mentioned before, I'm amazed with what, with what you presented. It's a very interesting uh, subject, and we hope to see more about this OpenJDK, the JFR, the JMC um, uh, stuff on the upcoming DevNation Tech Talks. Thank you for watching today, and Andrew, thank you for presenting this amazing presentation. Thank you. Hopefully it wasn't too dense. <laughs> it was. Uh, uh, on point. Yeah. And uh, see you next week on the next upcoming DevNation Tech Talk. Great. Thanks. Bye.